Salem Baptist Church. Here we are again, live online. I uh, I swore about seven months ago, whenever we were uh, going on doing our online services because of COVID, that once we got back in live uh, or in person services, that uh, I was never going to do it again. Uh, but I didn't take into consideration the snow. So here we are again this morning, live. Uh, I uh, got up this morning about I guess about six five thirty six o'clock. Looked out, it was raining. I was like, hey, maybe we'll be able to have church this morning, and but then I seen it shift to snow about seven o'clock, and uh, so uh, so here we are back uh, uh, back behind the camera. I hate preaching to a camera. I'd rather see your face this morning, but hey, we'll do what we got to do. I, I I said I wasn't going to do it anymore. I didn't do it last week. I said we missed one week. That's fine, uh, but uh, but we can't miss two weeks. And I got to preach, so so I figured we would uh, uh, get together and have church this morning online. Uh, I just want to welcome State Line Baptist Church, also Calvary. Bible Baptist Church. Welcome this morning. Uh, this is my office. <laughs> this is Clyde or George, whatever you want to call him. He's here with us this morning. Uh, you all ain't seen him in a while, so here he is. Uh, watching the weather forecast, they're saying that the snow is supposed to get uh, taper off. Matter of fact, I'm looking outside now. It's, it's starting to clear up just a little bit, or at least the rain starting to turn to rain. But what they're saying is that this is going to freeze up. Whatever slush is left after the rain is going to freeze up this evening. So so get out there, get your snow shovels after you watch the preaching this morning, and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, uh, get it cleared off. I think we're going to head up to church as well, make sure that's all cleared up. We're good to go for Wednesday. But uh, anyway, let's get the morning started off in prayer. Uh, uh, Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning you blessed us with. Thank you for the privilege it is to gather together, even though we're not physically gathering together, Lord, that our church, that our church family is gathered uh, online, Lord, we're worshiping you this morning, Lord. I pray and ask you bless the online services. Got some singing, got some preaching uh, as well, Father. I pray, pray and ask you bless as we uh, worship. Father, I pray and ask you feed your church this morning. Help us to feed from your word as we grow a little closer to you. Father, I pray and ask if somebody's watching by online this morning that's not saved, Father, this morning be a great morning, a great morning where they bow their head in belief and call on your name and be saved. Father, we thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, had a couple songs this morning I want to send to you. Uh, uh, it's, uh, let me see, I got, I'm got online, so my, my, uh, my eyes are getting older. My computer's way over there. But uh, uh, first song uh, I pulled out of our archives from back when we were on lockdown, uh, our group sang a song called Were You There? So I'm going to play that one first. And then I got another one right after that. So uh, here we go. Oh, mm -hmm. 
Sister Toya uh, messaged me this morning. I, I, we, I was going to preach this sermon, The Unseen Hand of God, uh, a couple or a couple weeks ago, no, last week. And I got a hold of Sister Toya and said, hey, you got a song in your pocket that goes along with it? And she said, I do. So she, uh, so, but we didn't have church last week. So I was getting ready to do it this morning. I put it up online, said what I was going to preach on. So she messaged me. She said, Pastor, I got, I got the song. You want me to record it? Yes, absolutely. So she sent it to me. And uh, I rushed real quick right before uh, uh, the service this morning. I got it uh, ready to go. So I'm going to cue this up. And we got another song by uh, Sister Toya, live from this morning. So here we go. That 
golden strand. I'll praise Him for His guiding hand. I'm trusting to That guides me through this weary land And some sweet day I'll reach that strand Still guided by the unseen hand Amen. Thank you, Sister Tolia. I appreciate you rushing, uh, getting that over to me this morning. Uh, what a blessing it is when a church works together. I, I really appreciate everybody's state line, everything they do to get, uh, get the services up and running. Uh, but uh, if you have, you have your Bibles, I trust you have it handy, ready this morning, your note paper ready to go. I want to preach on the unseen hand of God, Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 7. If you grab your Bibles, turn there, Proverbs chapter 16. And verse 7, and what I want you to do this morning, if you're, I mean, I trust you're watching online. If you're watching, I, 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 I would encourage you to share it. Uh, this is a great way to witness to your friends and family on your Facebook. So click that share thing and send it out to your friends and family. Uh, I, I'm going to have a little bit of salvation invitation as well. If you're watching, uh, give me an, an amen. Our friends from the north up in Pennsylvania, you Yankees, give me an amen. Those that are below the Mason-Dixon line, you know, state lines right on that line. You know, if you're below the Mason-Dixon line, you're a hillbilly, give me a hey man, you know. <laughs> if you're a liberal, give me an hey woman, I mean, whatever works. I just want to know you're watching and you're tuned in, you're being faithful to the 11 o'clock hour even though we're not gathering together and uh, just want to uh, make, I just want to say hi afterwards, always check afterwards, see who was watching. So anyway, the unseen hand of God, I want to preach on that this morning. It's a... Um, uh, as a Christian, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're born again, you're saved, you know what I'm talking about. The power of God in your life, the God opening those doors for you that you know there's no possible way that you could have opened up, but only God's hand could have done that. You know what I'm talking about. And as a Christian, uh, you want that. Uh, as a, even as a lost person, I would think you want God's hand <laughs> moving. You know, you want to get saved and see God's hands moving. Uh, you want that. You want life to go according to God's will. You want God going ahead of you and opening doors. And I studied this morning, or, or this week, or the past week, on this, this topic of the unseen hand of God, His hand moving in your life in areas that you can't see. So if you got your Bibles handy, my text verse this morning is Proverbs Chapter 16 and verse 7. I love this verse. Now, you're going to say, that. What is, how does that go with the unseen hand of God? I'll, I'll explain in my sermon. But uh, verse 7, it says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he may get, get this, even his enemies to be at peace with him. When, when, God, when, when your walk pleases God, uh, the Bible says that even, even, uh, even your enemies will be at peace with you. We're going to talk about that, but let's go to the Lord and uh, ask his blessing on the sermon this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the sermon. Thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege it is to open the book and study it. Father, I pray and ask, Lord, although we're not gathered in the house this morning, we're gathered together virtually online. I pray and ask that you would feed us this morning. Pray for those down at Calvary Bible, Lord. I pray and ask you would uh, bless them as well, Lord. Help our, our churches, to, Lord, just to gather and feast together on your word. I pray and ask, Lord, that you feed us. Give us something this morning that we would uh, apply to our lives to be more like Christ. Lord, I pray and ask that you would uh, bless the service this morning. I pray and ask again, if somebody's watch is not saved, they'd be saved today. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I um, 
one of my wife's favorite book is the book of Esther. Uh, Esther is, a, is an interesting book, and the reason why I really like that book and read it multiple times, obviously, is because the book never mentions God. And, and that's what's interesting about the book. It never mentions God, but what you can see as you read the book, and you can't, just can't help but see the hand of God moving through the whole book. What's interesting, just a quick summary of the book, there, there was a, an evil man that comes up in the book named Haman. Haman absolutely despised the Jews, and specifically a fellow named Mordecai. I mean, he despised them. He was kind of the right-hand man of the king, and he wanted to see them absolutely exterminated. That's kind of the plot of the book. And uh, But, uh, but you, as you start to read the book, you see God's hand moving even before Haman starts this evil plan. King Ahasuerus, he, uh, he had a fight with his wife in the beginning of the book because uh, he wanted to pray her around and show her off, but she wouldn't have it. So he gets mad and he says, you know what, you're out of here. And he was depressed and the guys in the kingdom got together and said, you know what, I got an idea, king. How about we do this? How about we go out into your 127 provinces and let's pick out all the beautiful young girls and we're going to bring them and parade them in front of you. At least 127, maybe more. We're not told how many. And you can pick out of one of them to be the queen. And, uh, and that's what he did. He said, you know what? That's a good idea. Go ahead and do that. So he get, they go out they bring out all these young girls and they're parading uh, in front of them. But it just so happens, and I like to use that, just so happens that he gets his eyes on a young girl named Esther. And, and, and a young Jewish girl, out of all the ones he could have picked, but he picked this one young girl and he fell, and absolutely fell in love with her. But it also just so happened her older cousin Mordecai, which actually raised Esther, uh, overheard one day, he was in the right place at the right time, he overheard a plot to have the king killed. And he, and he kind of foiled that plot and he kind of won favor for the king. Again, just so happened? Coincidence? I don't think so. I think God was in it, obviously. Uh, but anyway, Mordecai approaches Esther and says, listen, I've got a game plan. Uh, you know Haman's going to have all the Jews exterminated, but you being a Jew and, and the queen, and nobody knows that you are a Jew, but why don't you go before the king and plead the case of the Jews on our behalf, and maybe God can choose you, or use you to save the Jews. And you see, and she's kind of scared. She goes, well, you know what? It's I, Nobody goes before the king. If somebody goes before the king, even the queen, uninvited, they could be killed. But but she says, you know what? If I perish, I perish. I'm going to do it. So she goes before the king, and, and, and it just so happened that the king softened her heart, or, or softened, uh, or, I'm sorry, God softened the king's heart, and uh, Esther went in, and he said, you know, whatever you want to the half of my kingdom, you can have it all, whatever you want. Uh, that, that was God moving again. And she said, you know what? I want to prepare a banquet. I want to have a banquet that uh, that uh, I can invite you and Haman to. And uh, and he says, absolutely, let's do that. So so she prepares the banquet and uh, and, and and has everything planned out. Uh, but one night before the banquet, Haman. Uh, or, I'm sorry, King Ahasuerus, he can't sleep. It's in the middle of the night, he's wide awake, and he says, why don't you bring the Chronicles to me? I want to read the Chronicles. So the, the people, I mean, who does that in the middle of the night? Well, God moved on his heart. And uh, and he began to read the Chronicles, and he's like, you know, I uh, he said, have we ever uh, rewarded Mordecai? And and he's like, no. He said, well, we need to reward him. And then you see the hand of God moving again. Uh, the hand of God began to move. He said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you get Haman? <laughs> and Haman could parade him around the city, and, uh, and and, and, and you know, Haman's worst nightmare. Again, you see, in the midst of Haman's plot, God began to move. Uh, and then they have the banquets. And then at the banquet, uh, Esther reveals a couple of things. Well, she says, first off, she says, your right-hand man, Haman, he's wanting to kill all the Jews. And by the way, your queen, me, <laughs> I'm a Jew. And, uh, and of course, uh, the king's uh, is wrath. He's angry. And what's he do? He has Haman hanged on the very gallows that he had planned for Mordecai. As you know, the story goes, and then, and then, and then the king overrides the decree or, or creates a new decree to protect the Jews, and at the end, it all wins. Uh, you know, the Jews win. Again, you don't see the name of God mentioned through the book, but you can see the unseen hand of God moving, making things happen to protect God's people. You've seen that. I mean, it wasn't just a coincidence that out of 127 plus young ladies that the, the king fell in love with this young Jewish girl. It wasn't just 
just a coincidence that Mordecai was in the right place at the right time to hear the plot against the king. It wasn't just a coincidence that the king couldn't sleep and he had to get up in the middle of the night to get this all uh, unfolded. It, it, was, it wasn't just a coincidence that, that Haman winds up dead and the Jews say, what was it? It was God's hand, invisible hand, working behind the scenes. And as a Christian, as a believer, we know what that's like. We know if you've been saved for very long and you walk in the way you ought to walk, you'll begin to see God do things. And you're like, and you know in your heart there's no possible way that happened outside the hand of God. As Christians, as Christians, we want that. As Christians, we desire that. As Christians, we need that. Because he's going to call us to do some crazy things. So I, 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 I dug through the Bible, and, and, uh, and I, I, I found a few things. But, but I want to get to our text first. In Proverbs chapter 16, you see this uh, played out. Proverbs 16, verse 7. Let's read it again. If you look down at your Bibles, it says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Folks, the hardest thing to, to restore is a broken relationship. The hardest thing to restore is somebody that hates you. It takes actually something beyond you. Matter of fact, let me read you a verse. Proverbs 18, 19 says, A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. You know, it, it's difficult to win somebody to you that, that's been angry, it's, it, that's mad at you, that, that considers you an enemy. But when it, the Bible says when you please the Lord, He will make things happen. He'll make that, that person to be at peace with you. I want to. I, I dug through the Bible, and, and I and I found six things that 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 teach us about the unseen hand of God. More specifically, six things that we can do that pleases the Lord that will help us to see the unseen hand of God. Because if you're not pleasing the Lord, according to our text, you won't necessarily see the power of God in your life. So I found six things, and I got a, I got the outline. I put it in the uh, in the uh, side there on Facebook. So you, if you if you get lost in the middle, or if I speed talk and uh, you miss a point, uh, the, the six points are there. So six points, six things we can do to please the Lord. Let's jump right away. Right. First off, number one, God is pleased when his children stays out of sin. God is pleased when his children stay out of sin. Listen to this. Psalms chapter 5 verse 4 says, Thou art a, not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. I, I, when I was taking pneumatology, uh, we were studying on the holiness of God. If you want to understand how much God hates sin... You look at his attributes, and one of the attributes of his holiness, when you study the Bible of just how holy God is, you really begin to understand how much he hates sin, and the way we ought to hate sin as well. I just dug through the Bible. I think about Moses as one example, that he, he wanted to see God, and, and God says, you know what, you can't even look on me and live, so he had to hide Moses in the cleft of the rock just so he would not. Just the very sight of God, the presence of God, uh, in, in that way would have killed him. He said, no, you, you can't do that. I think of the prophet Isaiah, I found that. He, he just caught a vision of God sitting on the throne, a vision. And, uh, and angels flying around crying, holy, holy, holy. Listen to Isaiah the prophet's response. He said, then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He said, just a vision of what's going on around the throne. He looked around and he said, oh my goodness, I feel dirty. <laughs> I feel sinful. He's looking around, the, uh, he said, even the people around, I live in a sinful world. Looking at the holiness of God, he realized how what, what, what a sinner he actually was. The Apostle John in Revelation 1.17, when he got a glimpse of the glorified Holy Christ, he said this, he says, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Uh, Jesus, I think about this, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was looking at the cup, and that cup that was filled with all the sin of the world, he, he said for the first time, he said, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. That's his hatred for sin. Matter of fact, while Jesus was on the cross, for the first time in all of eternity, God turned his back on his son. He forsook his son because of mine and your sin. Christ cries out, that is say, My God, my God. 
Why hast thou forsaken me? Folks, when we understand, when we study the book, and we look at how much God hates sin, it makes us understand how holy He is and how much we should want to walk holy like He is. Folks, let me tell you something. God is a holy and righteous God, can't even look on sin, and we all, and if we expect to see the unseen hand of God moving in our life, we've got to get the sin out of our life. You're praying for a job. You're praying for God to move in your family. You're praying for the unseen hand of God to do things in your life, but, uh, but and, then you, and then you're walking in sin, you're like, scratch your head like, why don't I see God's hand moving? You've got to understand, God's holy. And if you want to please Him, you've got to be holy as He is holy. Get the sin out of your life. And that will open up the door of the unseen hand of God to be able to move in your life. Number two. The second thing I see that pleases God here is God is pleased when we go soul winning. So, old preacher, here you go talking about soul winning. Absolutely, because Jesus was a soul winner. Psalms chapter 149 verse 4 says, For the Lord God, give this, for the Lord taketh pleasure... In his people, he will beautify the meek with salvation. Saved people are God's people. Born again Christians are God's people. And the more saved people God has on this earth, the more he is pleased. So, so in other words, we ought to be out winning souls to please God even more. I mean, you think about this. God created every single human being on the face of this earth. Every, every human being, He has created them. Yet there are some that worship Buddha. There are some that decided, I don't want to believe in Him at all. I want to be an atheist. There are some that worship false gods of every kind of thing you can possibly imagine all over this world. And I think about God. And I think Him sitting on His throne. And how perfect and righteous and holy He is. And his, there's some in His creation that are not even worshiping Him. There's some that are worshiping false gods. He doesn't like that. He's pleased when people get saved and worship Him. Listen, Ezekiel 33, 11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, ye from e your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? When Jesus was baptized, when He come up out of the water, after he was baptized, God from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Why did he say that? He said that because when Jesus went down in that, that water, he pictured the death. And when he come back out of the water, he pictured the resurrection. The death, burial, and the resurrection, the gospel, he acted it out. In a, and that's what we do when we identify with the death, burial, and resurrection. We get baptized. And when Christ did that, he didn't do it to wash away his sins, as some teach, because he was sinless. He did that to picture the gospel. And when he pictured the gospel, his Father up in heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. If God's pleased with the gospel getting out, if God's pleased, then He would be even more pleased when we as His children take that good news and go out to the wicked, go out to the lost, and win them to Christ. If you want to see the unseen hand God moving in your life, get out there and tell somebody about Jesus. I'm amazed as a pastor, as a Christian, how many people call themselves Christians and they don't go out of their way to tell somebody about Jesus. Oh, if somebody comes to them and asks them how, they, you know, they might open their mouth a little bit. But I'm talking about real, genuine going out and looking for those lost souls. Taking some time out of your week. Taking some time to go out and tell somebody how to get saved. If you want to see the unseen hand of God moving in your life, become a witness for Jesus Christ. Number three. If you want to see the unseen hand of God, third, or third thing I see that pleases God, God is pleased when we serve Him. Listen to this, Proverbs, I'm sorry, Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. It says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not, get this, Paul says to the Philippian church, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Get this, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Paul says, you've been saved, now get to work. You've been born again. He didn't say you know, work to get saved. He said, now that you've been saved, get to work. And he says, this is where his good pleasure is. To do his will through your salvation. 
through your life. That's what pleases God. And matter of fact, he says, Paul says to the Philippian church, he was bragging on them. We're studying them now on Wednesday nights. He says, not as in my presence only. In other words, the Philippian church says, you weren't doing it just because the preacher was around. You were doing it because you genuinely loved the Lord. Folks, I'll tell you, that pleases God when, when you do it not for, for because somebody's watching, but you just do it because you love Him. See, that shows where your heart is. You know, you, know, you don't just show up on Sunday morning acting Christian, but you're doing you're 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 serving Him twenty four seven. Your life is given to Him. Uh, you know, when you do something without being told, it shows your heart. I, I, I'll give you an example. Husbands, it's your wife's anniversary. Do you? Well, how? Look, here's the first scenario. First scenario is she calls you up and says, uh, just a reminder. <laughs> It's our anniversary. Can you stop by the store on the way home and pick up some flowers <laughs> and bring them home and maybe take me out to dinner tonight? You know? I'm just calling this as a reminder. And then he comes home and he does all that. Would that mean a lot to her? No. But what if she, uh, she didn't say anything and he comes home and said, I got a surprise for you. <laughs> Ta-da, here's some flowers. You know? <laughs> Matter of fact, I made, a, I made reservations at Texas Roadhouse. They don't even need reservations, but anyway, we're going there, and, uh, and, and I'm going to surprise. Yeah, that would mean a lot more, because she didn't have to tell him. She didn't have to oversee him. See, you know, you know, I, when, when you do something without being told, it means a whole lot more. I remember uh, about a, year, a couple of years ago, uh, it was a Wednesday night. Uh, the youth always went soul winning. That was our thing. And uh, we'd always go up Oxford, Rising Sun somewhere. We'd go hand out tracts, talk to people about Christ. And uh, I can't remember why, but it was a Wednesday night. I got jammed up with some stuff in church, and I couldn't get there in time for uh, soul winning. So I, I messaged the teens. I said, listen, guys, I can't make it tonight. I said, we'll just skip tonight. Uh, and it blessed my heart because the response from the teens was, well, can we go? Because we want to go soul winning. And I was like, I, it, it meant something to me. And I'll tell you why it meant something to me. Because I didn't have to tell them. They weren't just going because oh, the preacher's going. They, they went because they wanted to go. They went because they wanted to go out in the streets. You know, when, 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 we, when we serve God, we're, and we do it on our own, we do it because we want to, and we do it because we love Him, that shows our heart. See, folks, let me tell you something. God didn't save you and say, well, that's it, you're done, come on home, you got saved, now there's... No, He, he saved you and left you here as an ambassador for Christ. He left you here as a representative of heaven. He left you here to now that you're saved to reach out and get more saved and serve Him. Plug into a local church. Find your uh, God's calling in your life and serve Him. If you want to see the unseen hand of God moving in your life, find a place where He has you. Plug in and get busy for the Lord. Number four, the fourth thing that pleases God. God is pleased when his people walk by faith. Now this is interesting. Uh, uh, the verses I got, if you want to write these down, Hebrews 10, 38, let me read that to you. It says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. <laughs> the just shall live by faith. I, I, uh, we walk by faith. I'm, and I'm going to explain that. But when we say, you know what, I need some evidence, God, before I move, he says, I don't have no pleasure in that. The things I call you to do, sometimes it'll scare you to death. And sometimes you've got to take a step out in faith. That's what pleases me. That's what I get pleasure out of. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder, and then to diligently seek him. You know, we see, as Christians, we see so much evidence of God. We don't always... Uh, you know, there's, uh, God's fingerprints are, is everywhere. Uh, I mean, we, uh, we, we know when we got saved, something changed. I, I know when I, the night I got saved, something changed. There was an inner desire that was not there after I got saved that began to grow in the Lord as I, as I started serving and going to church. I changed that night. Uh, you know, we can feel His presence everywhere we go. You can be alone in a deer stand on, uh, on a golf course or, or all by yourself in the middle of the woods. And you can still feel the presence of God right there with you. You know what I mean if, 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 as being a Christian. You know that presence. I've tried to explain that to non-believers. You don't understand. 
It, the presence of God is so real that if you want evidence, there is the evidence. I was witnessing to a young man this week online, and he said, where's the evidence? I said, man, it's all around us. You know, I, we, can, we can see direct answer to prayer. When we prayed for Lauren to have a job at the prayer service, and then 10 minutes after we prayed, she gets a text, hey, you're hired. I mean, there's, you know, we see evidence all around, but there's so much more than the evidence that we've seen. Folks, there is an unseen battle going on all around us. There's God moving things like we see in the book of Esther that we can't see. And God will call you to do some things that will scare you to death in light of those things we can't see. You know, it, that's why he says walking by faith. Sometimes the doors that he calls you through, you can't see in that room. But he says go anyway. And that scares you to death. But you've got to believe that he is able to do what he's called you to do. You know, that ministry that he's called you to do, you say, well, I can't do that. You're right. But he can. Yeah, that's where you've got to take a step in faith. A calling that scares you to death. I remember when I was called to preach, I'm like... No way, God. <laughs> I can't do it. It's, this is not, I wasn't raised like that. I find that it, you know, it scared me. And, uh, you know, but I, I took a step of faith. That, 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 that serving that he's called you to do that takes you out of your comfort zone. I'm going to pick on Zach. Uh, we were on our way down to Rock Hall. And I said, Zach, you know, you're so faithful. You love soul winning. You're faithful to church. You've got a heart for the Lord. I said, why don't you get up and, and, and do a Bible verse and preach a little bit. Just a little bit. Just give me a minute. And it's like a deer in the headlights look. Oh, yeah. I was like, now you can do this, brother. You can do this. And, uh, you know, scared him to death. See, that's stepping out of your comfort zone. And, you know, that takes faith. Because you don't know if you're going to get up there and just lock up and stare at the computer or the, or the congregation. You don't know. It, you know i got to believe that when I get up there, God's going to be able to do what He's called me to do. You know, that burden that He's put on your heart, that seems almost impossible. There's no possible way that I could ever get that done, but God's called you to do it. You know, that's walking by faith, folks. And that, according to my Bible, is what pleases God. That's what gets him, gets God, gives God pleasure. Is when you, He calls you to do something that scares you to death, and you don't know how to get it done, and you don't know the means, and you're looking at yourself and saying, I don't even have the talent to get that done. But God says, I still want you to go. And you take that step of faith. That pleases God. Do you walk by faith? Do, do, do you take on those ministries, those callings that scares you to death, but you say, you know what, I'm going to go? When I, uh, uh, when I started preaching, let me tell you something. At, uh, at what I've been preaching for a while, but, uh, but once I stepped into the pulpit to stay in Baptist church, I was petrified. Literally petrified. But I knew there was something God had for me to do, and I had to do it. I, I, I was more afraid of failing than I was uh, of, uh, of, of, of failing Him. So I stepped into it. So if you want to see the unseen hand of God moving in your life, I challenge you. Start walking by faith. Take those steps. Number five, got to hurry. Number five, the fifth thing that pleases God is God is pleased when we fear Him. God is pleased when we fear Him. Psalms 147 verse 11 says, The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear Him, in those that hope in His mercy. i got to think about this. Why can't we leave the church unlocked anymore? I remember... Was a pastor why talking about uh, Pastor Cunningham back in the nineties? Used to leave the church unlocked. Uh, I was like, wow, because we can't do that now. Uh, we've had our church broken into. We had to set up security sy uh, system because uh, we had things stolen out of the church. We've had the vans broken into here recently. We just had uh, we just had one of the Cadillac converter stole off of one of our church vans. It's going to cost the church about three hundred bucks to get it fixed. Um, why does that happen now that it didn't used to happen? See. There was a time even when heathens respected and feared God. Oh, they might not God saved, but when it comes to God's house, they had a fear and a respect. That's gone, folks. That's the, that's the generation we live in. But let's get, get away from the, the lost. What about the saved? Even the saved doesn't have a, a, a whole lot of fear for God anymore. Uh, why can't we pack out church revival services anymore? When I hear of the good old days... Uh, when they throw a tent up or, uh, or call, uh, call for a revival, and they would be like a week, extended weeks. And now we're lucky to get a few people to come to a three-day revival. Why? People don't fear God anymore. Well, uh, you know, why, why is it uh, that nobody takes on any big ministries anymore? They don't fear God. 
They're like, well, you know what? That takes me out of my comfort zone. I'm kind of happy just living my life, sitting in the back pew, showing up a couple of Sundays a month, and I'm good. Where's the fear of God? When my, when my calling, as I preached on the last point, I was scared to death to let God down. As, as scary as that pulpit was, and, and, I, and I'm like, God, there's other guys way better at it than me. Why are you calling me? But, but, but the fear of stumbling in the pulpit wasn't near as scary or more as, as much fear as letting God down. You know, nobody takes on big ministries anymore. What happened to packed altar calls? Weeping for the lost. What happened to people at the, at the altar, Christians, repenting of sin and getting their life right? You don't see that anymore. I was talking to Brother Lefebvre. I said, you know, because he does the 10 revival services. And he's like, he's like, nobody comes up anymore. What happened? We lost the fear of God. Christians has lost the fear of God. You know, why is it that, that Christians can, can uh, you know, fight at the drop of a hat? I've seen Christians split a church wide open and walk away just as proud as could be. Like they did something. I'm like, you've got to stand before God and give an account for that. You've got to, you know, the, 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 the dust that you left after you left the church and busted this up and got mad at everybody, went on Facebook and gossip. you're going to stand before God and give an account for that. Where's the fear of God? You know, I, why is there no fear anymore? Because, no, there's no, because they've lost the fear of standing before God. They've lost the fear of accountability. A lost person, if you're watching and you're not saved, let me tell you something. You're going to stand before God one day at the great white throne of judgment and give an account for the sin in your life. Ultimately be cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. I remember as a lost person. I, was, I hated thinking about it. I was lost, but I definitely believed that there was a hell. And I knew down in my heart, even though I made false professions over and over again, I knew down in my heart that if I died right now, I'd split hell wide open. And I can't tell you how many nights I laid in bed uh, uh, staring at the ceiling thinking, just pushing those, those thoughts out of my head, in love with my sin. You know, but I, but I thought about that. The lost people, let me tell you something. If you're here, you're not, or if you're watching and you're not saved, let me tell you something. There is a real God. There is a real hell. And you're going to be dead for a long time. And you need to fear God and call on Him and be saved. A Christian, let me tell you something. There is accountability. There is accountability. You, you, yeah, you're saved. Yeah, you're going to enter the same heaven as I do. But folks, let me tell you something. If you're in sin... If you're not walking the way you ought to walk, you're going to stand before God one day and give an account before that. You know, where is the chastisement? I fear chastisement. I fear the hand of God coming in on my life when I step out of line. What keep, one of the things that keeps me in the pulpit on the hardest days to be a pastor is more fear of facing the battles that I face as a pastor, uh, or i got more fear of God than the battles I face. I don't want to stand before God and say, you know what, I quit. <laughs> I fear him. I fear the chastisement that may come if I step out of the pulpit. I fear the chastisement of God, if the hand of God, when I step out and do something I shouldn't be doing and stepping into sin. You know, a, a child that fears his parent will, will walk the way he ought to walk. But a child that doesn't fear his parent, he'll skip over curfew. Show up whenever he wants, she wants. Uh, 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 you know, do what they want, no matter what, and no matter and and what well, they just don't fear their parents. And as a child of God, we are the same way. When we fear, we don't fear God. We step out into things we shouldn't be. If you're watching this morning, you say, "Well, I fear God." How's your life? How's your life? Are are you walking in sin openly? And you say, "Well, then, then you couldn't fear God." Because the same God, the God of the Bible, says if you're his child, he's not going to turn a blind eye to that. He will bring chastisement your way. See, folks, let me tell you something. What pleases God is when we fear him. When we fear him, we please God, and we please God, that opens up the hand of God in our lives. Number six, last point. God is pleased when he is first in our lives. God is pleased when he is first in our lives. Haggai uh, chapter 1, verses 7 through 8, it says, uh, This saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up into the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and will be glorified, saith the Lord. 
The context of the book of Haggai, the book was written post-captivity of the Jews. When they were returning back to the promised land, they were, they were rebuilding everything, the temple and everything. And God wanted them to say, I want you to build the temple. I want you to rebuild it. But they had a couple of problems, two problems. First problem was they faced a lot of opposition. I mean, there was constant opposition as they tried to build the temple, and that hindered them. But the other problem was, was their personal life was getting in the way of building the temple. And they let their personal life their, uh, get in the way. They, their priorities were all messed up. They basically gave God what was left. Oh, if I get time, you know, the kids has got soccer practice this week. You know, you know, I got a lot of things going on at home. And, you know, I, and if I get time, then I'm going to get up to the temple. And God rebuked them. He says, consider your ways. Look at what you're doing. Check out your life. Do you got the right order uh, the way it's supposed to be? Am I on the top of the list? Or do I get whatever's left down at the bottom of the list? When it comes to your service, do I get the top or I get whatever's left? When it comes to your, your giving, do I get the top or do I get whatever's left? You know, consider your ways is what he said. You know, when we put God first, it pleases him. And when it pleases him, the unseen hand of God begins to work in our lives. Let me give you some scripture. Matthew chapter 6, in verse 3, it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. See, our job is to seek God's kingdom. His job is is to take, if you read that chapter 6 all in context, his job is to take care of all of our basic needs of life and even our desires and wants as well. He says, you, you, let me, you let me worry about you, you just worry about the kingdom. That's what I want you to do. And see, the problem is, we as Christians, when we get that all mixed up, we get our life mixed up. See what Christian, a lot of Christians do today, they say, well, you know what, God, you worry about you, I'll take care of my life. God says, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> You worry about what I've told you, and, and then I'll take care of all those other things you're, you're struggling for. You know, are you trying to find a good job? Seek the kingdom. Put God first. Are you trying to get your bills leveled out, trying to figure out how to get out of debt and get things away, and you say, well, God, I'll get to you in a minute. I've got to worry about this. No, no, no. Seek God first, and watch the unseen hand of God begin to move in areas you can't move. You know, are you trying to get your marriage straight now? You've got marriage issues, your husband and wife, and you're fighting all the time. You say, well, God, I'll, I'll deal with you later. Right now, I've got to get my marriage straight now. No, 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 that ain't how it works. Seek God first in His kingdom, His righteousness, and He'll deal with your marriage. And you'll begin to see hearts being softened, things being forgiven, and things being moved. Are you trying to keep your family together, your kids walking right? Say, well, God, I've got things at home to take care of. No, no, no. Seek God and watch God begin to take care of all those things. See, when we seek God and, and start to put Him first, all of a sudden, you'll see that job begin to open up and say, man, I didn't even try. And all of a sudden, I get a call and say, you know what, we're hiring, why don't you come in? All of a sudden, you'll see that husband, that wife begin to soften up and say, you know what, we've been fighting off a lot, but maybe we ought to get together and get things right. Maybe you'll see your marriage, your family, you know, all, all these issues will kind of work themselves out and while, while you're taking care of God and His righteous, and the unseen hand of God will be working in those areas first. Put God first, and then you'll see the unseen hand of God begin to move in your life. So let's close this up. Life is hard. And folks, let me tell you something. Even as a, as a born-again Christian, life is difficult. Ministries are hard. Serving God is difficult. But, but when we please Him, then the unseen hand of God will begin to go behind the scenes in areas you can't reach, areas that you can't see, and He'll begin to open things up that, that will just... Uh, and I can testify as, as a born-again Christian, I've seen God do some mighty miracle things. Uh, just the, the one thing that's just been on the top of my brain for the last six months is how God moved in Rock Hall and connected us with the right people and just seeing a huge blessing down there. Do you want to see the hand of God move? Uh, you know, you know, keep your life out of sin. You know, don't, 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 t uh, if, uh, or go around and start telling people how to get saved. Begin soul winning. Serve Him. Step out in faith. Fear God. Put God first in your life. And folks, when you begin to do that, you'll tap into a power up in heaven 
and God will begin to bless your life. Amen? Well, I'll say this. I wish we were at church. I'd be doing uh, every head bowed, every eye closed, but we're not at church. But I, I want to leave with this. If you're not saved, if you're watching this and you're not saved, oh man, I would love to tell you how to get saved. Uh, look me up on Facebook. Give me a call, whatever. Uh, I don't care when. Your salvation is the most important thing. I'd be honored to come and sit with you and talk to you about salvation. Uh, and Christian, how's your walk? L let today be the day that you say, you know what? After we come close here, you get on your knees and say, God, I haven't been walking away. I'll walk. But today's going to be the day. Today's going to be the day because I want to see your hand in my life. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this service this morning. Thank you for the privilege it is to serve you. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you, Lord, uh, for the uh, uh, Calvary Bible Baptist Church. Lord, I pray this you bless them. Lord, I pray this you keep us safe today as we got to get some things done with the snow removal and all that. Uh, I pray this you bless. Thank you for our church. Bless the rest of this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, State Line, uh, hopefully see you Wednesday night. Uh, Calvary Bible Baptist Church, I did not, did, we didn't get to see you today, but hopefully we'll see you next week. And uh, having said that, we're going to close service. God bless.